just two days or less than 48 hours from now, we'll be entering another Roman calendar year. Mr. Weston's telecast 2024 in Bible prophecy focused on the Middle East and prophecy and lessons from Zechariah the 12th chapter. Uh, he gives five trends for 2024 to watch for and we previewed that program as we heard the announcement last Sabbath at the Charlotte Family Weekend. But those who have not seen it, be sure to watch this weekend and pray that it will have an impact on millions of viewers. We know that the world faces cosmicide and total destruction. The famous doomsday clock for the bullet of atomic scientists is set the midnight uh, doomsday time at 90 seconds before midnight. On Tuesday, January 23rd of uh, 2024, uh, they will update the doomsday clock, and it'll be interesting to see how many seconds they move it forward, or if they move it backward, I doubt that, and, uh, or keep it the same. But we know that we are getting closer to th that midnight hour. And as we approach the new calendar year of 2024, we all need to face the future with faith. The calendar year requires us to review our past year, to evaluate, and to make plans for the future. Many of us, of course, have to uh, calculate our income taxes, and that's coming up uh, due April uh, 15th for federal and state taxes. So we take a look at the last year and try to learn even lessons from it. And we look forward to the beginning of God's new year, which this year is April 9th, uh, 2024. And of course, look forward to Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. We know that we're living in exciting and challenging times. We're in the end time and, and prophecy. And we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. And we know that we have to be close to God the Father and close to Christ as the Terrible times continue to magnify and all kinds of disasters. In today's sermon, I want to give you a main spiritual strategy we all practice and we need to strengthen in the future. We need to reinforce and strengthen this spiritual force. The title of the sermon today is Face the Future with Faith. We are living in a world headed for self-destruction. We know any time we look at the news or look at the newspapers, my wife and I do every, day, every morning, generally with the Wall Street Journal, and realize what's going on in the world, we are bombarded with information and distractions and disruptions of all kinds. And we've been warned in sermons and telecasts and in publications to face the future. But how can we face the future with faith? One answer is with livingyouth.org, podcast number 79, A Future of Hope. It's a Mr. Gerald Weston's podcast. There's, these podcasts have been a mystery to me, but uh, the answer to that mystery is not livingeducation.org, but livingyouth.org, and as soon as you uh, access that webcast, you'll find podcast number 79 uh, by Mr. Wesson, A Future of Hope. We can also have a future with hope as we, that hope is based on God's promises and based on faith. The World Ahead of Commentary, we heard Mr. Train read, and I'll just mention it for those who will see this uh, sermon later, The Value of Hope. Dr. Douglas Rodale writes, For many today, the future looks bleak. The world is in trouble with little hope of getting better, and our personal future is unclear. Yes, having a positive hope in the future is a vital aspect of life. End of quote. So our Savior gives us encouragement and instructions and warning. We turn to Luke, the 18th chapter. 
Luke, the 18th chapter. Here he gives the parable of the persistent widow. And then he makes this statement. Luke 18, verse 1. Luke 18 and uh, verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And sometimes our brethren lose heart. And Christ says, no, don't lose heart. Why? Because we need to face the future with hope and with faith. Because we have such an awesome revelation of God's plan of salvation. And we know that it's sure. We'll be talking about that more later on. But what does he say in verse 6? which we've been challenged before in sermons. Luke 18 and verse 6. Then he concluded the parable. Hear what the unjust says. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? He has crying out day and night. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes... Will he really find faith on the earth? That's a challenging question to all of us. Will he really find faith on the earth? Well, brethren, I personally believe that we in God's church have that genuine faith now, that we do have faith on the earth right now among our brethren around the world. But we must strengthen our faith and we need to reinforce our faith. And we must exercise godly faith. So in today's sermon, I will, we'll discuss the book of James and godly faith, characteristics of godly faith, applications of living faith, biblical examples of faith, keys to increase your faith, and our mission of faith. A week ago, we had the Charlotte Family Weekend a Bible study on the book of James and godly faith. Turn to James, the second chapter. Here we're going to, first of all, discuss the biblical definition of faith. And James certainly gives us the definition and the contrast between worldly faith and godly faith. James 2. And starting with verse 14, James 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to him, depart in peace, be warned and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. So James says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you know, oh fool, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And so we realize, yes, what kind of faith do you have? Really, it is not the faith, the works that justify you, but the works demonstrate what kind of faith will justify you. It's a living faith, and of course he contrasts that with demonic faith. Even the demons believe and tremble. And of course you want to know what about more about genuine faith. You turn to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the faith chapter. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or for the word substance, you could sub, you know, say revelation or the realization of things not hoped for, things hoped for. Or as the NIV has it, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So you're wondering, 
what is my degree of faith? Is it genuine faith? How do I know that I have faith? Well, part of the key is what degree of assurance do you have? Do you assured that what God has promised, what is revealed is real? And you know that you know that God has given this power and it is sure, absolutely sure, what God has said is going to come to pass. We've had several sermons on faith. We've had uh, Dr. Jeffrey Fall, uh, Facets of Living Faith, uh, Mario Hernandez on Living Faith. We've had a uh, sermon, A Work of Faith, and uh, Another sermon, Men, Women, and Children of Faith. That's number 1085. Turn now to James, the first chapter, James 1. So we've discussed what genuine faith is like contrasted to worldly faith. Now we want to talk about the book of James on faith. Uh, during the Charlotte Family Weekend, we had a Bible study on the book of James and godly faith. We saw the importance of this book of the inspired order of the Bible. Instead of Romans following the book of Acts, James follows the book of Acts as the most important book following. I hope all of you have your, your copy of uh, the Bible, Fact or Fiction, and at the centerfold is the symmetry of the Bible. You have the symmetry of the scripture, the Old Testament. You have the law, the prophets, and the writings, the, the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. And then in the New Testament, we have here section number four of the seven sections of the Bible, Christ establishes the church. So the first section of the New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. But what follows after that? Not the book of Romans, as Mr. Weston points out in his book on the law and law or grace, which is it? You'll realize, no, Romans is not the book that follows the book of Acts, but the book of James, the first of general epistles. So the fifth section of the seven part Bible is the general epistles you have James, Peter, John, and Jude. And so James is the first of those books following. So it's very, very important, a, a, a book perhaps that we haven't emphasized as much uh, because we quote from the, Paul's epistles quite often, but the book of James is very important. And if you have not read in sequence Acts and then following the book of Acts, read the book of James. It's a big difference. Then you have the sixth section of the Bible, the symmetry of Scripture. You have the Pauline epistles. And then included, of course, is the book of Hebrews, which follows First and Second Thessalonians. And you have Hebrews, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and then, of course, the seventh section of the Bible, the book of Revelation. So again, I hope you'll review that symmetry of Scripture and uh, hope that uh, uh, some of you can all recite the inspired order of, all, order of the Bible, all 49 books, seven times seven in the inspired order. So James chapter 1 and verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some of the critics say, well, that, that James doesn't talk much about Christ. Well, it starts very often, right at the very beginning, that he's a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ and even talks about the second coming of the Lord. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. So we find the introduction 
of the theme of the book of James is faith right from the very beginning. And the testing of your faith that works patience. So we realize that, yes, we grow in faith through testing and trials. In the Charlotte family weekend, I gave an outline of the book of James showing how the theme of faith continues throughout the book. And I'll just mention it here. Uh, you don't have the handout in front of you. Those who are at the Bible study uh, have the handout. But I'll just outline uh, the book of James here as you see it in the theme of faith. So chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, is faith tested by trials. James 1, verses 19 through 27, is faith tested by doing God's work, by God's word. Then the next section on faith is chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, faith tested in the congregation. Are you one that is partial to people? Chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, Faith tested by works. We already saw that in James, the second chapter. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Faith demonstrated by exercising self-control. Chapter 4 through chapter 5, verse 12. Faith tested in the world. And you realize that one section, that, that God is jealous over us, that adulterers and adulterers, don't you, know, don't you know that the friendship of the world is enmity against God? Though God wants us to make sure that we are not uh, playing uh, games in the world. Chapter 5, verse 13 through 20, faith demonstrated by contact with God. And of course, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to us. That's James 4 and the verse 8. So we see that the very theme of the book of James is godly faith. Next, we'll take a look at some biblical examples of faith. I won't, uh, well, yes, we'll turn to Hebrews, back to Hebrews 11, and uh, just back a page from James 1, uh, Hebrews 11, and verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so then he follow, gives the biblical examples of faith, the following, including um, uh, Noah and Abraham, and uh, of course many other men, women in the faith. I'm going to mention several other biblical examples of faith, but I won't turn to those scriptures. We have Mary, Lazarus' sister, anointed Jesus' feet. That story is in Matthew uh, 26 and uh, verses 10 through, through 12. And Jesus said that, that whenever her name was mentioned, whenever the story was mentioned, that he said it, it will be a memorial to her what this woman has done when she Again, use that alabaster, very precious ointment on his feet and wiped, her, wiped his feet with her hair. He said, this woman has done, will, will also be told as a memorial to, to her. And then you have the example of Esther, who was willing to sacrifice her life if necessary to save her people. Then you have children or teenagers or young people or examples of faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel, the third chapter. So Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and, his, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And then you have the example of Hannah, 
who was crying out that God would give her a son, and it happened to be Samuel, who was called as, a, as even a little child. And then you have King David, who even as a teenager and as a, and as a shepherd, he had faith as well. As it says in 1 Samuel 17, 17, more, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, his, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine, talking about his fight with Goliath. That he, but he had been delivered by a, from a lion and delivered from a paw from, of the uh, a paw of the bear. And then Jesus at age 12, you know, stayed behind and was discussing and giving questions to the elders. And he said to his parents, Luke 2, verse 49, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? At age 12. So we all need men, women, and children of faith. Next, we'll discuss what some of the characteristics of faith. Turn to Ephesians, of the third chapter. Ephesians, the third chapter. What are some of the characteristics of faith? Ephesians 3 and verse 11. Ephesians 3, verse 11, breaking in the middle of a thought. According to the eternal purpose which he accompanied in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That Verse 17, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. Yes, the characteristic of faith is that we may have boldness. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So boldness is one of the characteristics of faith. And then, of course, another characteristic of faith is doing what is right. And I... I I ask God, I make mistakes all the time, and I'm wondering, how can I overcome these mistakes? Well, there's a promise in Psalm 23 that I claim uh, from time to time. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's Psalm 23 and verse 3. One of the characteristics of faith is doing what's right. And... Uh, even so I make mistakes, I'm still learning lessons of life, but I claim this promise that he will lead me in the paths of righteousness, as he promises in Psalm 23 and verse 3. Then we also have faith as a gift. Turn to Romans, the 12th chapter. You know, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 talk about spiritual gifts. But Romans, the 12th chapter, and uh, verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So God gives us a gift of faith, and yet we can... Strengthen our faith and grow in faith. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. And we know that the miracles are taking place by, by the faith. Remember when Peter healed, the, or God healed through Peter, the man at the gate beautiful at the temple in Acts the third chapter, he said, Why, how is this done? Acts 3, verse 16. And his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you now, 
you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So yes, God gives us faith. And realize, yes, faith can also have confidence. I wonder sometimes, though, do I have enough confidence? But I claim the promise that God gives us, and I think it's Proverbs 14, 6, and the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. But 1 John 4, 18, I should know 1 John 4, 18, a very basic scripture for all people in public speaking who have the fear of public speaking, the perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And so sometimes if I'm a little nervous, I ask God for that perfect love that casts out fear. As I mentioned, Proverbs 14, verse 26, and the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. It's not selfish confidence, but God's, God's confidence. So consider the characteristics of faith in your own life. Next, we'll talk about degrees of faith. How strong is your faith? Do you have a weak faith? And of course, God has called us to fulfill the Great Commission. And uh, Dr. Meredith set the sevenfold commission of the church, number seven, to build an atmosphere of radiant faith with God's church. So here we're told that we as God's people need to have a radiant faith. Can we say that I have a radiant faith or you have a radiant faith? It's something if it maybe is a goal it's something we're striving for and growing in. You realize, yes, you turn to uh, Matthew, the, I won't turn to Matthew 6, I'll just mention it where and Jesus talks about uh, God clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, and Jesus chides his audience, will he not more clothe you, O you of how strong a faith of little faith. So, are there degrees of faith? Yes. Uh, Jesus chided his audience that they had little faith. And also, uh, by to Matthew 14, there's a classic example of wavering faith, I guess you would call it. Matthew, the 14th chapter. And here... Jesus came walking on the water uh, during this, this great storm. And uh, Peter asked, asked him to, to have him come out, in the, out on the water. He said, verse 28, uh, Matthew 14. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus let him drown. No, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you now, when he had his face on, the, on looking toward Jesus, he was able to walk on the water. But when he looked at the around, instead of having his attention on Christ, then he began to sink. So we need to again always have our attention on the throne of grace. As Peter said, you know, Cast all your burden upon the Lord when you're, you're troubled. But here he said, you little of faith. So how can we have strong faith? And we realize, I, I won't turn there, but Romans 14 talks about church members who are, have little faith. 
Romans 14, 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. So, yes, we have members in our congregation that are weak in the faith, and we need to help them and encourage them and strengthen them. So realize we all need to grow in strength. Turn to Romans, the fourth chapter. Here again we have the example of Abraham and his example of faith. Romans, the fourth chapter, verse 19. How strong was Abraham's faith? Romans 4, verse 19. And not being weak in faith. Not being weak in faith. He did not consider his own body of already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform. So here's another definition of faith. Actually, in verse 20, uh, 21, and being fully convinced that what God had promised he was able to perform it was a strong definition for faith. But it, Abraham was not weak in faith. He was strengthened in faith, it tells us. And we all need to be strengthened in faith as we face the challenges of 2024. First Corinthians 15 and verse 13. I'll just read it to you. First Corinthians 15 verse 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all things that you do be done with love. So we've seen some of the characteristics of faith, and we need to be strengthened in faith. So what are the keys to increasing your faith? Turn to Luke, the 17th chapter. Luke 17. We've seen that people are weak in the faith. Abraham strengthened his faith, and he was not weak in faith. How can we strengthen our faith? The disciples asked that very same question to Jesus. Luke 17 and verse 5. Luke 17 and verse 5. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. What was his answer? How to increase his faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. <laughs> if you had a faith as a grain of mustard seed, but you just don't do these things by playing games. You want to do it with God's will and his pleasure, of which of you having a servant plowing and tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat to eat. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. Verse 9 Does he think that servant because thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded to him? I think not. Verse 10, so likewise you, when you have done all the things which you have commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants, we have done which our duty to do. So how did Jesus answer the question, increase our faith? In other words, be a profitable servant. In fact, we had a uh, sermon by that title uh, by D. Barapartian years ago. Increase, Lord, increase our faith was the title of Mr. Partian's sermon. And also we have Dr. Meredith's sermon on increasing faith as well. So another key to 
Increasing your faith is to be a profitable servant. What's another key? I was uh, reading last night from the uh, booklet, uh, Understanding Bible Prophecy, and uh, came across this quote on page 43. Quote, as we learned earlier, one vital purpose of prophecy is to confirm our faith. Recognizing the many prophecies fulfilled in the past and even seeing prophecies fulfilled in our own, future, our own lifetime today, we can gain deeper faith in the prophecies yet to come. And we, saw, we can understand how we too can be a part of the glorious future God has prophesied for his faithful Christian servants in this age who will be resurrected in the, as first fruits at his return to serve unto him in the prophesied kingdom of God. So when we see the fulfilled prophecies, the prophecies being fulfilled in our own lifetime, we can gain deeper faith. And of course, we have the booklet, prophecies, uh, Prophecy Fulfilled, God's Hand in World Affairs. So uh, you can read that booklet if you have it in some time. And then, of course, we have the admonition four times in the Bible, the just shall live by faith. And I'll just give you those references. It's Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul shall not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Romans 1:17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3, verse 11. But that one is justified by the law, and the, no one is justified by the law. The sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, says God. So the just shall live by faith. Well, how does one live by faith? What is your key biblical principle you live by that gives you assurance and that helps you to live each day by faith? One that I rely on personally is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. I think of that very often, but I know it's a promise of God, and I claim that promise, and it gives me confidence, assurance, and faith. Proverbs 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And so, again, as I told you before, uh, my wife several times a day, well, well, let's pray about this. So, uh, I immediately say a prayer, whatever question or issue she wants us to pray about. Just acknowledge him in all your ways, and he shall direct your paths. And then, of course, we have the sermon on claiming God's promises. And we have uh, Second Peter, the first chapter, that God has given us exceedingly great and precious promises. By these we may be partakers of his divine nature. Not just promises, but exceedingly great and precious promises. You claim those promises, and you can grow in faith. And then, of course, we have the sermons, and, and God we trust. We have that motto on our U.S. coins and, and uh, currency. But uh, Congress... We passed a law July 30th, 1956 that showed that our paper currency would have In God We Trust as well. We have the sermons on our website, In God We Trust, and one by Mr. Weston, Trust and Obey. And of course, obedience is a part of the matter of fulfilling a godly faith. One of the challenges, principles of living by faith, I've emphasized in sermons before, is Colossians 3 and verse 16. So turn back to Colossians 3 and 
verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's another way of increasing your faith. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart in the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, here's the key, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Is there anything you do in your life that you would not do in the name of Christ? That should be a key of what you might need to modify your behavior or your character if there's something that you're doing that you couldn't do in the name of Christ. One of God's faithful ministers over the year, Mr. Armstrong, described the matter of joy in defeat. And we've mentioned time again that those in the past uh, uh, apostasy of, of men who were uh, leaders in the church, and yet what characteristic was missing? That characteristic was a total, the missing was the total surrender in God. Mr. Ar Mr. Armstrong wrote in his uh, book, Volume 1, Chapter 7, in his autobiography, this uh, particular quote. It's called, the subhead is joy in defeat. Quote, this surrender to God, this repentance, this giving up of the world of friends and associates and of everything was the most bitter pill I ever swallowed. Yet it was the only medicine in all my life that ever brought a healing. For I actually began to realize that I was finding joy beyond words to describe in this total defeat. I had actually found joy in the study of the Bible, in this discovery of how new truths heretofore hidden from my consciousness, and in surrendering to God in complete repentance, I found unspeakable joy in accepting Jesus Christ as personal Savior and my present High Priest. So Passover is just 16 weeks away on April 21st. Uh, 2024, and some of you may be considering uh, baptism before that Passover. If you are, uh, just see our pastor, Mr. John Strain. And you will also want to review Mr. Weston's sermon, Essentials of Baptism, that's available, of course, on our members.lcg website. So true repentance brings joy to sinners. And you realize that, yes, you are making a commitment of your life. You're giving your life to God and to Christ. And there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. So how do you increase your faith? You realize, yes, you have faith with works. You claim God's promises. You're a profitable servant. And along that line, I'll just read from Mr. Weston's booklet on Law of Grace, uh, pages 11 and 12. Notice the unambiguous statements by these four writers, beginning with James, where he calls the Ten Commandments the perfect law of liberty. James 1, verse 25 and says that we will be judged by the law of liberty, chapter 2, verse 10 and 12. That law of liberty, the Ten Commandments, as is shown in verse 11, Martin Luther disrespected when he called James' letter an epistle of straw, saying had nothing to do with the gospel, that is, nothing of his faith alone thesis. Luther uh, champion. But what does James himself, the half-brother of Jesus, say? But do you know, want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? 
and by works faith was made perfect. James 2, verses 20 through 22. Now who are you going to listen to? Christ's half-brother, Mr. Weston writes, or a confirmed Roman Catholic priest gone rogue. Luther was correct that the excesses of indulgence and other works of the Catholic Church were in error. But his solution of grace apart from law was absolutely not correct. That's from Mr. Weston's booklet on law and grace, which is it? So how do we increase our faith? Another principle, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So reading the Bible and hearing the word of God, making it a part of your, your very character, helps increase your faith. We have a sermon by Dr. Douglas Winneo, the Bible, key to faith. A sermon by Douglas Winnell, the Bible, key to faith. Yes, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And I all previously mentioned claiming God's promises. So we trust God to bring you into the kingdom is another promise. Philippians 1 and verse 3. Turn to Philippians 1 and verse 3. And this is one I think that many of our brethren who are a little, I guess you would say, kind of tenuous or maybe weak in the faith and wondering, am I going to make it in, into God's kingdom or not? Well, this should, should encourage you and strengthen your faith if you claim this particular promise in Philippians, the first chapter. Philippians 1 and verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing verse 6 is the key verse here being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ so those of you who are kind of weak in the faith, you say, am I going to make it to the kingdom? Here's a promise God says, he will bring it to pass. He will bring you into the kingdom if you submit to him and trust in him. Yes, we can all grow in the faith as we trust in God to create in us his perfect character. And remember that, yes, as we do these things, we will never stumble. It tells us in Second Peter, the... First chapter, Second Peter 1, of course, we have the matter of God's promises, but he tells us here in Second Peter 1, Second Peter 1 and uh, verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither barren, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For, note this, if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So God says, yes, you have things to do but he will help you into the kingdom if you do your part. So apply these keys to increase your faith. Next, turn to Hebrews 11, verse 13, which we already read once before. But this next section is commit yourself to live and die in the faith. Commit yourself to live and die in the faith. 
Hebrews 11 and verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off, were assured of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Embrace them. I like that expression. In fact, Mr. Weston's sermon the last Sabbath was embrace your calling. So all these died in faith. In 2023, we had several ministers and ministers' wives that, that died and are asleep in Jesus. On May 26, 2023, Wanda Chrisman, age 79, widow of Elder Dwayne Chrisman. July 6, 2023, Lolita Martin, age 89, widow of Elder Valentino Martin. July 7, 2023, Benito Parbo, age 84, elder in the Philippines. July 9th, 2023, Henry Cooper, age 79, an elder in Ireland. August 2023, Gail, Gail Ulrich, age 83, widow of elder Gary Ulrich. August 23, 23, Elizabeth Best, age 84, wife of elder Frank Best. And so, brethren, not only, of course, we have elders and elders' wives who died in 23, but if you take a look at the Living Church News, the November-December issue, and we have in every issue of the Living Church News a feature called In Loving Memory, and I hope you read those, the obituaries of our brethren who have died. And in the November-December issue of the Living Church News, Loving Memory, we had seven obituaries. How old were those who died? Of the seven people who died, the average age of death was 87.4 years of age. So God is giving our people a long life. In some instances, not everyone lives that long. But of the, I hope you'll read that in section in loving memory in the Living Church News. They are faithful. And they are part of that, those who died in the faith, as we read in Hebrews 11 and verse 13. And then he gives us the promise, you know, in Revelation 3.10 for the, the Philadelphia church. Because you have kept thy command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth, the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. So we need to be faithful to the end, commit ourselves to live by faith, commit ourselves to die in the faith. We have the sermon, Faithful and Loyal Servants. Are you a faithful steward? A faithful to the end, another sermon that you can access on our website. We all need to persevere and endure to the end. I've shared this with you before, but it was some time ago when in the winter time all the leaves of the trees in our backyard had all disappeared from the trees but there was one this one leaf that kept clinging to the tree day by day so i wrote a poem along the line of that persevering leaf it's called the little clinging leaf the little lonely clinging leaf, the last one on the tree, appears outside our kitchen window just for me to see. There is a lesson in life to learn. It's clear to the rich and poor. You always have God's faithful help while striving to endure. So that little clinging leaf was a lesson for me and I think for, for all of us. And of course, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. We think about the matter of our closeness to God. And uh, when I think about my relationship with God the Father and with Christ, I think about this section in Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, if you turn back there, Jeremiah, uh, the 13th chapter, and verse 11. 
How close are you to God? Jeremiah 13, 11. For as the girdle cleaves to the loins of a man, <laughs> so I... Uh, what do you what what does your girdle cleave close to you? As a girdle cleaves to the loins of a man, so I have cause to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, says the Lord, that they may be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. The New King James Version has, instead of cleaving, for as the sash clings to the waist of a man. So I've caused the whole house of Judah and Israel to cling to me, says the Lord. Or as the Good News Translation has it, just as shorts fit tightly around the waist, so I have intended all the people of Israel and Judah to hold tightly to me. So again, how close are you to God? I ask God that I can cleave to him and cling uh, to him. So brethren, commit yourselves to live and die in the faith. Strive to increase your faith and realize that yes, in spite of the Trials we all experience, we need to continue to do good, as it tells us in 1 Peter 4, 18. 1 Peter 4, 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Again, we have that assurance that God is a faithful creator, and he's going to bring us into the kingdom. The NIV <clears throat> has it, even when we suffer, we need to continue to do good. The NIV has it. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So even while you're in a suffering condition, you're, you're experiencing trials and tests, God says, continue to do good. The NRSV has it. Therefore, let those suffering in accordance to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. So brethren, let's commit ourselves to live and die in the faith, to increase our faith. Jesus told his disciples how to do that as we read in Luke 17, to be profitable servants. Let's turn to, well, you don't need to turn there. I read it at the beginning of the sermon, Luke 18, verse 7. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So the faith that we need to have, of course, is not only our faith, which we grow in and strengthen, but also the gift of God's faith, the Christ's faith, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. But the faith I now, but the life I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's our faith and Christ's faith, as I said in Romans 1, from faith to faith. It's our faith and Christ's faith that we grow and live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. 2024 will bring us one year closer to World War III in Armageddon. But 2024 will also bring us one more year closer to the kingdom of God and the return of Jesus Christ. So brethren, let's commit ourselves to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ, to live and die in the faith, and realize, yes, our brethren, all died in the faith. And we need to live each day by faith. So pray that you can do your part for the Great Commission. And remember that we are privileged to serve in the greatest work of faith on earth today. How can we face the future with faith? We have God's awesome plan and promise 
of the kingdom coming. The king of kings is coming. Micah 4, verse 4. But everyone shall sit under his own fig tree, under his vine and his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. That's how we can have faith. So rejoice in your calling to serve our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ. You can review Mr. Weston's sermon last week, Embrace Your Calling. Strive to be profitable servants. Live each day by faith and face the future with faith.